So we are back and um, this next session, I'm actually on the wrong session. Uh, this next session is case studies from the field, resilience against lost and erasure. And I would like to uh, bring up our moderator, Shane Watson. Um, and, and thank you for, for moderating today's session. Hey, Michelle, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, am, I, am I ready to go? Yes, you're all good. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I have the, uh, my, my name is Shane Watson. I'm an architectural historian based in the San Francisco Bay Area. My uh, specialty is LGBTQ heritage preservation in, in, the, in San Francisco. Um, it is uh, my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to this group of very fierce women today. Um, I'll begin with uh, Natalie Hopkins. Hop Hopkinson is Associate Professor of Communication, Culture, and Media Studies at Howard University. She is the author of Go Go Live and A Mouth is Always Muzzled. Um, these book length essays exploring the arts, history, place, and social change were recognized by jurors at Penn America, the Hearst and Wright Foundation, Caribbean Studies Association, and the Independent Publishers Association, among others. Sojin Kim is a curator at the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, where she works on exhibitions, international festivals, local research projects, and media productions that focus on migration, music, and public history. She serves on the board of Asian and Pacific Islanders and Americans in Historic Preservation. Ashley Minner is a community-based visual artist from Baltimore, Maryland, an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. She received her MFA in 2011 from Maryland Institute of College of Arts and her PhD in American Studies from University of Maryland College Park. Ashley works as a professor at the practice and folk uh, folklorist in the uh, sorry as a professor of the practice and folklorist in the Department of American Studies at University of Maryland Baltimore County, where she also serves as director of the minor in public humanities. Antonio Castaneda, Professor of History Emeritus at St. Mary's University, taught women's and Chicano, Chicano studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and then the Department of History, UT Austin and St. Mary's University. Castaneda serves on the board of directors of Latinos and Heritage and Conservation and the National Collaborative for Women's History Sites. In 2009, she co-founded the West Side Preservation Alliance, a community-based historic preservation organization to preserve the history, culture, and structures of working class Mexican American communities. In 2011, Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar appointed Castaneda to the American Latino Scholars Expert Panel, which developed the American Latinos and the Making of the United States theme study. In 1984, Castaneda was a research associate on the Latino section of Five Views, an ethnic historic site survey for California which was one of the first projects and publications on Latino historic preservation in the United States. And finally, Alison Rose Jefferson, a third generation Californian. Alison Rose Jefferson is a historian and a heritage conservation consultant. Her applied history projects draw on the, her research of Southern California locales that feature historical significance as well as contemporary consequence to elucidate, elucidate the African-American experience during the Jim Crow era for Santa Monica's Belmar History and Art Project and the Central Avenue Heritage Trail with the Angels Walk in LA. She is a scholar in residence with the Institute for the Study of Los Angeles at Occidental Colleges for the spring 2021 semester, where, shall we, where she will in virtual campus and public programs share her work of recentering the African-American experience in local history and heritage conservation efforts. Her recent book, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era, was honored with the 2020 Miriam Matthews Ethnic History Award by the Los Angeles City Historical Society. Um, and so let's, let's begin, everyone. Um, Natalie Hopkinson. So I'm going to now share our screen and I just want you guys to confirm that you are seeing what you need to see. Um, so I'm guessing you see my desktop right now. Mm -hmm. And then do you now see our presentation? Yes. So yes. it's in, it's in presentation. presentation. Yes. Perfect. Um, hello everyone. Um, good to see everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers 
uh, for this, this conference. It's fantastic. It's a real honor to be here among, among people doing such important work, such powerful work. So Natalie and I are Zooming to you out of Washington, DC, and we're gonna be talking about um, community and culture, cultural erasure and marginalization here in the city of DC. And so we wanna start out by respectfully acknowledging the Piscataway people on whose historic territory DC was built and who continue to have a relationship with these lands that spread out west of the Chesapeake Bay. And we wanted to start you off with a short video to transport you to the place that is sort of ground zero for the case study that we're going to be discussing. Um, and we also want to introduce you to the music that is at the heart of this. Natalie, I'm wondering, since we have people from so many different places, that maybe we should clarify. <laughs> Absolutely. So hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I've really enjoyed all the presentations before. I've seen some familiar faces. I wish we could be in person so I could say hello and we could talk to each other, um, but thank you for sharing this time with us. Um, so we're talking about go go music, um, which is, uh, for those who are not familiar, uh, go go music is DC sound. It is a cousin of hip hop and funk, um, but it's uniquely DC, uh, came about in the 1970s, and people have been predicting its demise for decades, um, but it's very resilient. And Don't Mute DC is one of these uh, moments that it was able to show its resilience. So um, with that, I guess we could see this short video. So this is just a, a minute long. For those of you who have bad connectivity, hopefully it won't be too difficult to watch. I grew up during the era when Go-Go was DC. Go-Go was so powerful that when hip hop artists like Dougie Fresh and other people came, they, they had to open up for Chuck Brown. It was what defined growing up in DC. That was your social gathering. People would just get together in cars and listen to Go-Go um, CDs. No matter where you came from, whether you had more money, whether you were middle class, when you got in the room with Go-Go, you just, you know, the beat, the bounce beat came on, you just lost it and you were in the mode. And that was just the city vibe. Go-Go is, is, uh, is everything, you know, from music to style to dialect just how we live our everyday lives is all centered around go-go music go-go represents dc represents people born here um in a way that i think you can't even describe so when i hear it i hear me so um the case study that we are going to share with you revolves around the Don't Mute DC protests that were activated in spring 2019 um, in defense of go-go music and that we're also responding to persistent marginalization, displacement, and erasure of the history and culture of DC's Black residents. But I would say that our, our case study is not so much about historic preservation as it is about cultural sustainability and vitality. Um, it, it's about placekeeping and the importance of expressive culture in animating places and in helping to define shared cultural landscapes. And I'd say um, as well that the case study is also about efforts towards establishing equity um, in terms of which communities, which histories, which cultural expressions are, are viable, are valued, are visible, in this case are audible, um, supported, accessible, preserved. So we are going to break this presentation into three parts. Um, we're going to talk about, we're going to introduce you to the Don't Mute DC protests, which, in which um, Natalie was a very significant contributor. And then we want to describe two projects or um, interventions that extend from collaborations between um, the Howard University Department of Communication, Culture, and Media Studies and the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. So we'll talk about um, an oral history project that we produced together. And then we'll talk about some emergent and um, applied forward-facing efforts to leverage institutional support to ensure the sustainability of GoGo -Go into the future. Great. And so I will start by talking about Don't Meet DC. Yeah, uh, tell so me when you want me to change the slides. Okay. All right. So this corner was actually um, where all the video that we just shot was, this is 
the ground zero. Um, if any of you have been in DC, this is right near the Howard University Shaw Metro Station. Um, this is the fastest whitening zip code in the country, according to one study. Um, you know, also ground zero for gentrification. And um, but this corner, since 1995, um, it had been a cell phone store and a go-go record store. Uh, it's called Central Communication. In 2000, uh, late 2018, um, T-Mobile acquired Metro PCS, which is one of the um, uh, one of the cell phone carriers that uh, this gentleman, John, Don Campbell, who owned this store, uh, was selling. And, um, you know, as this area was gentrified, and I think we can probably go to the next slide. Um, so this, on the one side, he sold go-go CDs, and on the other side, he sold cell phones. <laughs> so if we can move to the next slide, I think shows the Shea. Yes, so this shot is from actually directly across the street from uh, the Metro PCS or Central Communication uh, and a luxury apartment building called the Shea. Um, and this was the ad campaign when it first arrived. She has arrived. Um, and the residents, one of the things that made that a, a real attraction was the music that you see, that you could always hear on that corner. And um, it had been playing there since 1995. Um, some of the new residents in that building called to complain exerted pressure on T-Mobile to have the music silenced. Um, and that sparked a whole um, chain of events um, that have been really uh, powerful for the, the culture. So if you wanna scroll to the next. Um, one of Donald Campbell's customers was a young uh, Howard University student named Julene Broomfield. She noticed the music was turned off. And so she was outraged by it, found out that it became, it was from the pressure from the Shea. Um, and so she started this hashtag called Don't Mute DC. So from there, and we can move to the next slide. Um, of course, I got wind of it um, and also was working with Ronald Moten, who's a community activist um, and a go-go promoter. Uh, we decided to create a uh, petition on change.org, picking up the hashtag, don't mute uh, DC's go-go music and culture. We ended up getting over 80,000 signatures um, from every state in the union um, and 97 countries around the world. People spoke up and signed this petition to support this corner store being able to play this music. Um, and so that was a huge victory. But of course we knew that there was it wasn't just about the music. So it also, um, we kept this movement going so we can move to the next slide. Um, I think the next slide, I don't know, there's a little bit of lag on mine. Um, so people were happy that the music came back on but they also knew that the issues around um, gentrification and erasure were still around. So actually, I'm sorry, if you can go back to the one before the Mochella. Um, there was, so the music, T-Mobile said, okay, we're going to, we will allow the music to go to turn back on, um, but people were still angry and upset about the fact, the audacity of them trying to shut the music down. So one of the um, musical demonstrations that came out was a thing, was called Mochella. Uh, between four to 5,000 Go-Go fans came out to the corner of 14th and New Street and for a live concert um, in the middle of a week, <laughs> middle of a weeknight. Um, and then if you want to go to the next slide now, um, there also were more protests around issues of gentrification, cuts to um, institutions in DC that were really critical to the survival of black people in DC. So United Medical Center was the only hospital in ward seven or eight, which, is, which are the, the blackest wards in the city. Um, that was getting ready to be shut down by the city council. So there was a go-go to pr protest that, to protest um, cuts to education, um, cuts to jobs programs. So there was another go-go protest that actually successfully lobbied to get that money, millions of dollars restored back into the budget for these programs. Um, so I think was that the last one or one more? Uh, yeah, that's, that's what we got for this. But I, but I think it's, it's super important what Natalie's saying is just how much even after the music got turned on, how people really took this and kept the momentum going and kept continued to mobilize around various different issues. 
So Natalie and I had about a year before these protests emerged, we had started to work together, her office and mine, um, on ideas for programming related to the theme of the social power of music and DC communities. And so as the Don't Mute DC protests and programs were gaining momentum, we decided to organize an oral history project because we wanted to gather insights and stories from a, a cross section of people who were involved in these actions. So here's the, actually the inside of the back side of Don's store where you see the CDs that he sells. And you know, many of us, when we work on oral history projects, public history projects, we are often working with and, and trying to record stories about aspects of unrecorded history from people who lived those experiences a long, long, long time ago. And I think what was really interesting and rewarding about this project in, in, a, in almost a more journalistic way is that we were documenting a movement as it was unfolding. So we were capturing and creating a record of people's intentions and their experiences um, versus sort of later as an act of like historical recovery. And we had, uh, we enlisted four really expert interviewers to come help and lead the interviewers. This is Nico Hobson, who runs an internet radio station devoted to GoGo. And we interviewed a total of 14 people. We, and we have the video, the audio, the photos, transcripts, and we've archived them in the archives of the center where I work, the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage, our RINs are archives. And we wanted to, um, in Natalie's words, sort of bring the voices of some of these people into um, this conference, we wanted you to hear from them. So we're going to share some excerpts from the interviews and we probably don't have time for all of the ones that we queued up. So I'm gonna, I feel bad because I'm gonna actually be muting <laughs> these people as they go through the slides. But they're, they're, we just were so impressed and taken by the way that people's comments expressed directly and then implicitly very particular and personal and then sometimes political meanings of place and the way that people describe the stakes um, and the history of of go go music, and then also just the complicated ecosystem of the forces that impact the vitality of go go. So, we want to again share with you some of these voices. Chocolate City. That's a beautiful vision. Huh? When I think of that, I think about music, the cookouts, um, block parties, uh, house parties. I grew up in the fun era, man. <laughs> House parties, man. You ain't have to worry about a lot of stuff as a kid, you know, just partying in the house. My block, First Street, Northwest, Leroy Park area. We knew that whole, like four or five blocks, like everybody in every household from, the, cause my grandmother, and my neighbor's grandmother, they grew up together. And my mom, his dad, every household I've been in, like every house on my block. Chocolate City. So, so, so when we talk about if, is gentrification a good or a bad thing, I think it's going to be what we make it. But I do know this, the, the, again, we have born um, creating systems. And, and, and opportunities for those born here to, to attach to all the growth. I don't think they were forecast in, 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 in most of uh, the plans, right? That's evident that those that, that were born and raised here have not been uh, factored in enough into the plans. And so um, I plan on doing something about that. Like we can't just, I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, that's what the whole DC Native movement was about. Don't Mute DC was about, like all of that at the, at the cusp or at its foundation was about that. Right? How do we be included? How do we not feel like strangers in our homeland, you know? And then I'm just going to click through a few of them. This is Ron who co, um, who co produced the petition that um, went viral and got the 80,000 signatures and who is now um, starting up a go-go museum and cafe. There are several. And this is Don Campbell, the actual owner of Metro PCS. Julene, who started the hashtag, and she talks a lot about the, the thinking around the idea of mute and muting people and muting culture as a part of a process of erasure. And I'm just gonna play this one, Natalie, and then I'm gonna turn it back to you. Sure. This is not just about just like shutting down this, this, this store. This is about something, or the music. This is something bigger. This is about taking away a culture, driving people out of a city. 
when people say, oh my God, what happened? Everything's changed. They got to realize that it's not just about the coffee shops and the new condos. What happened to the people who lived there before? Where are they? Um, they've been displaced. And what Don't Move DC kind of means is that we're not only talking about music, we're talking about the people, the people who have been removed from a city that they once enjoyed, that now they have been purposely bought out. This is not just. And we learn from the pay and we learn. And I just want to say we will make, um, well, all of this is available through the Ralph Rinsler archives eventually as we process it, but we are going to make these excerpts also available from our website and we'll share a link later. Okay, and so um, for the next section of this presentation, we just want to talk about um, more about how we institutionalize the support. So the fact that people don't know what GoGo -Go is and there's so little awareness within DC, um, you know, outside of Black Washington, it's very, very racialized, segregated uh, uh, cultural uh, phenomenon is, is a result of, you know, white system. Uh, supremacy and, and systematic racism within the cultural institutions. You know, this is an art form that has not necessarily been considered an art form. It's been criminalized um, for much of its history. And Don't Mute DC was really a turning point um, to where people started to understand it more as a, an asset um, as opposed to being a problem. And one of the ways that that really became um, apparent was with this legislation the GoGo -Go Official Music of the District of Columbia Designation Act of 2019, um, the city council moved to make GoGo -Go the official music of DC. So that was signed um, in February of uh, 2020. So that was one. Um, and of course, many of us advocated for that. Um, I, I wrote a New York Times op-ed, make GoGo -Go official, <laughs> DC's official music. Um, this is a batch of my students at the hearing uh, there were dozens of people, artists, fans, people who testified in support of this legislation. Um, so we can move to the next slide. And um, one of the things that we also hope to, um, ways to institutionalize the support is a project called the Traditional Arts DC, uh, which is something that's uh, coming out of my department at Howard. Um, we're looking at this as an intervention um, you know, GoGo -Go is not something that was the receipt of, um, it was, was getting a lot of institutional support through the traditional, um, traditional ways that art, that, say the Shakespeare theater gets support. And so this is an intervention. Um, so this program, we're doing field, uh, field research, cultural programming, um, and really sort of centering uh, the black experience. And, you know, that's part of the, um, this is one of the outcomes um, that, you know, that we're working on as far as uh, this uh, legislation. So partnering with the um, DC Arts Commission, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and also the Smithsonian uh, Folklife Sojin, her team have been, you know, huge partners. Uh, we've also just over the last, couple of years, starting with when, um, you know, Sojin and I started working together in 20, 2018, you know, we've just been amassing different um, institutional partners, you know, from local radio stations you see here to the Kennedy Center Culture Caucus, um, you know, Howard, of course, and uh, the Smithsonian. I think we might have another slide here with more partners, the DC Public Library, Events DC, um, the Office of Cable, Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, you know, we're just really part of traditional arts DC is really trying to get everybody together to bring GoGo -Go in. It's a little bit late since it started in the 70s, um, but you know, we're, we're, we're off to, we're really working hard um, to find out ways to, to um, you know, to support it for the long haul. So um, I think I can I don't know what else to add to that piece. Is there anything I'm forgetting from that? No, I think that that was great. And I know that we need to, to move over and, pro and provide space for the rest of the session to go on. So maybe we can close it up there. But I, I mean, I think the thing that Natalie has, has also emphasized is that, you know, work that is ongoing, that we don't think of things project to project, initiative to initiative, and it's a one-off, but trying to really keep building and expanding partnerships once they are established. And I think that's been really important to this work. 
And I guess one, just one thing I just want to end with is that one question we've always gotten is around go go and is it folk? Like people don't understand it as folk, and they they and it's it's pretty much every definition of folk is what you could say applies to go go, um, and it's sort of been this this uh, art that has been left out. So a lot of the institutionalization is figuring out ways to include um, and support in a way that's sustainable. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Natalie and Sojin. I'm so sorry I didn't introduce you at the beginning. Um, uh, next up, we have Antonio Castaneda. Am I unmuted? You're, you're ready to go. Okay. So, um, buenas tardes, everybody. Buenas tardes from San Antonio, Texas, the home of the Coahuiltegan peoples, who are now engaged uh, in another struggle with uh, the Alamo restoration. Uh, saludos a todas y a todos, y mil gracias a Michelle Magalón and the University of Maryland for hosting this symposium. Thank you to all colleagues and participants. I am honored to be here. I am reminded with the conversation, with the really critical conversation on solidarity, uh, of the earlier solidarity movements across, um, across people of colors uh, during the civil rights movements. Uh, I am reminded uh, with this symposium of uh, the Thinkers, Writers, and Scholars Symposium at Sacramento State University in, I think, 1976, where writers, scholars, thinkers of color were present. It was quite an exciting and important um, moment. I also want to say, picking up on um, colleague and friend Esteban Rael Galvez's comment about preservation, about being an accidental preservationist, and that applies to me too. Today, I place this discussion on Latinx resistance against loss and erasure within the framework of community-based institution building, most specifically institutions and related groups centered on preservation uh, of the history of the tangible and intangible heritage of the largely working class Mexican-American West Side San Antonio. Here, I focus on the Esperanza, uh, Peace and Justice Center and on the West Side Preservation Alliance, which is part of the institutional fabric the Esperanza has engendered. We are a community of practitioners, preservation from the ground up, to quote Michelle. Until the latter part of the 20th century, sorry, until the latter part of the 20th century, the church and the school were the major institutions to which Mexican Americans had recourse. And neither were of our own creation, nor did they necessarily serve us well. In Texas, de jure and de facto segregation reigned well beyond the 1960s and 70s. We waged the struggle for historic preservation against the legacies of structured systemic inequalities that other people have spoken of so eloquently. Let me focus first on the Esperanza, who in um, in 1986, a small group of courageous 20-something lesbian and straight women whose concern for injustices rooted in the intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, and disability, which Chicano and white feminist movement organizations of the time all too often dismissed. And so this group of young women created the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. Esperanza, which means hope, had as its mission to provide an institutional base from which to define the issues, frame strategies, organize and engage community members civically, culturally and politically. Precisely because most of the group, most of the organizers grew up in San Antonio and fully knew the pernicious effects of the quote unquote official story of the Alamo city they then defined history, art, and culture as the pillars on which to organize and develop the Esperanza. Cultural framing and programming became the mainstay of this new cultural arts institution dedicated to peace and justice. The preservation imperative, um, I 
that's next. The Westside Preservation Alliance in 2002, current and former residents of the West Side with the support of the Esperanza and San Anto Cultural Arts, another West Side organization, galvanized around the impending demolition of La Gloria, the rooftop garden, the, the rooftop garden space, familial and other celebrations were held of dancing, of orchestral music, as well as swing, listening to jazz and enjoying the evocative sounds of the emerging conjunto music of the 1920s. La Gloria mattered for the histories and memories it held, as well as because in an era of redlining of economic and cultural segregation and discrimination, it was a space created for and by the Mexican, Mexican-American community. The history and culture, cultural life of a community was at stake. We lost La Gloria in 2002, despite our collective efforts to save it. Um, the next two slides are just a couple of slides on some of the work of the WPA. I'll come back to La Gloria in a moment. Um, we have a speaker series. We started in 2018. Actually, uh, Sarah Gould, who spoke earlier, uh, was the person at the Esperanza at that time who started the speaker series. And then in 2019, we changed the name to the en Emma Tenayuca speaker series. And in October of this year, held a virtual symposium. This is uh, La Gloria Rooftop Garden um, that was um, in existence from the 1920s to the 1950s. We learned that it was to be sold and um, community organized and ultimately um, accumulated the funds to be able to purchase it, but um, the effort to do so did not work. And here we see Gloria Ramirez being detained while she's trying to reach the owner with a check to purchase La Gloria and to save it. Um, this is an image of Lermas. Uh, which it was, is another um, night, nightclub and home of Conjunto and Norteño music built in 1942. After we lost La Gloria, and I'll come back to talk about the development of the uh, WPA, then uh, in 2010, uh, Susana um, Segura and uh, the Esperanza at that time then organized the community. And here we see the community in uh, at the city council and part of the discussion and work that we do is working with community to um, uh, to engage civically and hear people who have never been to city council meetings and certainly not spoken before city council meetings um, gather their their information their knowledge and their courage and speak and speak loudly and eventually after several years years we lost La Gloria, but we saved Lermas and it is in process of being um, rehabilitated. So now coming back, when the pink building at, 13, at 1312 Guadalupe Street came under demolition orders, let me see, nope, nope, nope. Um, in 2009, we founded the WPA as a collaborative community-based preservation group to save it. The founding principles that guide us, as we saw earlier, conscientization or consciousness raising, preservation policy, and preservation of tangible and intangible heritage. And so the pink building, um, there was significant opposition to its uh, preservation, but eventually we were able to prevail and to save it. And here it is as uh, the Casa Maldonado, we learned through research and through uh, a lot of work that um, the history of the building and the Maldonado family, especially uh, William or Bill Maldonado. And this is a publication uh, by the Esperanza and the WPA uh, where the history of the building is, um, is written and detailed with uh, images and citations and such. Let me go back to... Um, we lost La Gloria and we lost um, the first Spanish language radio and television station in the United States. Originally KCOR Radio AM, then KCOR TV, which became KWEX 
KWEX TV and then Univision. Uh, it lasted from 1949 to 2013. This was a major struggle with injunctions. We stopped the demolition for a couple of weeks, but ultimately, ultimately we lost um, we, we lost Univision, um, the, the, the radio television station. And the issue as we thought about it and assessed uh, what had happened in part was that while we were um, grateful and happy to have saved Casa Maldonado uh, and see it still standing. Um, Univision was, as uh, Sarah Gould mentioned earlier, on the river and was prime property. And so it uh, is now the home of a $55 million uh, complex of condos and, and apartments. So I want to now talk about the ongoing challenges that we face, uh, beginning with where economic and political power and authority, authority rest. They are, uh, as we know, in the hands of developers and other interests primarily concerned with profit and also with elected officials concerned with the economic driver of tourism. The authority uh, of preservation is wielded by elected officials and officers of city department who do not know the history of Mexican Americans in San Antonio, who subscribe to the original to the official whitewash story of the Alamo, the defining historical site of San Antonio and of Texas, who also uphold unexamined preservation policies rooted in systemic structured inequality and who all too often operate on the basis of unexamined notions of progress. Our work to preserve places, place was and continues to be met with statements such as, quote, that building has no history. Why do you want to preserve it? It is not architecturally important, does not meet integrity standards, and no important person is associated with it. Besides, it, the building is ugly, shabby, in shambles, unquote. A case in point is the Univision building, as we've already uh, mentioned, which was demolished in 2013, despite the concurrence and support of local, state, and national historic preservation organizations that the building, uh, a significant part of our history, should be accorded landmark state, status and preserved. The building, our history, was demolished, which underscores the point that the rules are made, but then they're broken. So all of these important, significant uh, institutions supported the, um, uh, the preservation of the pink building of the Maldonado, Casa Maldonado, and yet it was demolished. Let me talk now then about realist resilience of the community and the methods or methodologies that we work with. Resilience of our preservation work is rooted in the history and culture of the community, and it is the basis of our, of our collective methodology, what we draw upon to meet the obstacles and to place justice at the center of our advocacy. We use what we have to advocate for preservation justice, and what we have is the power of the people. And their power, we draw on their resourcefulness, on survival skills, meaning making do and picking up again, despite adverse circumstances, belief in themselves, in their possibilities, in what they can do in their experience and knowledge. We draw on their compassion for themselves, for each other, and for the community at large. They even have compassion for those who oppose us at times. We draw on their historical, cultural, and other knowledge they possess, and the authority that that knowledge gives them. We draw on collective memory, on working class aesthetics and creativity, on calling and attending, on calling and attending WPA community meetings, on their ability and their willingness to engage civically, speaking at citizens to be heard at city council meetings. I want to comment that at city council meetings, we get three minutes per person. Uh, to uh, address whatever our concerns are, whereas lobbyists and uh, other folks get um, lunches and dinners and lots of other bennies. Uh, so meeting uh, and challenging preservation related possible policy, meeting with the mayor, with the city council of the district, uh, with press conferences and rallies. 
We draw on their values, on their humanistic values rooted in family and committee and community and adversity. We draw on their collaborative uh, spirit. And so we collaborate extensively. We establish partnerships and work collectively with local and national organizations to address preservation issues. We work with the Office of Historic Preservation, San Antonio Conservation Society, the Coalition to Save the Woolworth Building, the Design Forum, Mi Barrio No Se Vende, the Historic um, West Side Residents Association, and others. We also uh, draw on state and national um, organizations and we present at state and national associations such as NAX, the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies and the West, uh, Western History Association. Our current major challenge building is preserving and saving um, Alasana Pache Courts, which also Sarah spoke to earlier. We have been advocating for the rehabbing of Alasan for the last five years uh, and engaged certainly in community organizing. And most recently, uh, in early November, over 70 persons from diverse community-based organizations spoke before the Board of Trustees of the San Antonio Housing Authority, SAHA, protesting displacement of Alasan Apache community where the median, median income in that particular sector of the community is $12,000 per year and advocating for public housing, which is increasingly being eliminated. Saha and other public housing authorities are using mixed income uh, to replace segregated, the notion of segregated public housing. They argue, well, uh, we do not want people to be segregated in these enclaves. Um, so when these, when the public housing, these major public housing complexes were built in San Antonio, the Alasan was built for Mexicans. Wheatley courts were built for African Americans and Virginia courts, Victoria courts for um, whites, for Euro Americans. So as a result of that major initiative of the community organizing and uh, presenting, Saha has most recently revoked its contract with the developer who was to build mixed income housing to which very few current residents would be able to afford. Nevertheless, according to Saha, the Alasan community would be demolished along with the building. Community organizing and presence has momentarily stayed immediate demolishment of Alasan Apache courts, but it, it remains at great risk. So then as part of our work, we held uh, a historic exhibit, which uh, uh, Sarah Gould curated, was incredibly well attended <clears throat> and has received rather rave reviews. Uh, and, and we did it with uh, funding from Saha and District 5, but uh, still Saha and the District 5 council person advocate demolishing Saha, uh, demolishing Alassan. Um, so the west side uh, of San Antonio is, as we see in La Voz de Esperanza, which is Esperanza's monthly periodical, um, the west side is targeted for gentrification. And there are a variety of issues. Uh, certainly, uh, we have opposed gentrification mightily, and so have other organizations uh, in San Antonio. Still, there are other organizations in other locations, Austin and Los Angeles in particular, not yet in San Antonio, but possibly, um, who see arts and um, <clears throat> cultural arts and, and organizations as, as really being inviting uh, gentrification because the community is changed, um, arts and culture are focused, and for those organizations, um, they see that as inimical to the well-being of the community and to inviting gentrification. So uh, I think that as part of our discussion, it matters that we address uh, the broader issues as well as the more internal uh, tensions and issues that arise for us. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Antonia, and uh, 
We will now go to Ashley Minner. I'm sorry, did you mute? Did I what? Did you mute? Did you mute yourself? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? And see my screen? Thumbs up? We can hear you. We can see you. All right. My name is Ashley Minner. I'm an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina, and this is Revisiting the Reservation, the Lumbee Indian Community of East Baltimore, where I am from and where I'm presenting to you from today. It is part of the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway people, and um, often folks forget it's also the ancestral homeland of the Susquehannock people. And it was the Susquehannock, in fact, who ceded the land uh, that would become Baltimore to the colony of Maryland in 1652. Um, but today, the most populous group of indigenous people in the Baltimore region are members of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. You might infer from the name that we are not indigenous to here. That's correct. We are the descendants of folks who come from um, the region between the James River and what is now Virginia and the Great Peavy River in South Carolina, who fled enslavement and colonial warfare and uh, all sorts of horrible things to eventually coalesce into a community in what is today known as Robinson County, North Carolina, prior to the establishment of the United States of America. And this is what it looks like there. We take our name from the Lumber or the Lumbee River, which winds its way through our tribal homeland. It's very dark and swampy. Um, it's also known as Drowning Creek. And what doesn't look like the river and the swamp looks like this. This is a field of tobacco. I snapped this photo um, some years ago myself. And following the turn of the 20th century especially, many Lumbee folks found themselves sharecropping tobacco on their own tribal homeland. Um, they lost their land through the southern agricultural system and the preeminent Lumbee scholar Melinda Maynard Lowry draws a powerful comparison between what happened in the Carolinas to indigenous folks and their land to Indian removal out west. Um, and this is actually a picture of my mom and my uncles and my grandma standing by a field where they were sharecropping in the early 1950s. So not that much has changed. Um, also, this was the time of Jim Crow. And in this part of the world, there was tri-racial segregation, uh, where we're used to seeing white and black separate spaces or resources. In this area, there were white, black, and Indian um, separations, three separate school systems, three sections of the movie theater. Imagine three sections on a bus and trying to enforce that. So it was a very hard um, living. Uh, most Lumbee elders who lived through this time will tell you it's a modern day form of slavery. Um, and with segregation to boot, um, lore holds that many veterans of World War II, Lumbee veterans of World War II, passed through urban centers like Baltimore and Philadelphia and Detroit and found out that it was much easier to make a living working in factories um, and they wouldn't experience the same type of segregation in these places. So they left the river and the swamp and the fields and came to um, cities like Baltimore, where the largest community of Lumbees outside of North Carolina lives today. And they settled in an area around the intersection of South Broadway and East Baltimore streets in East Baltimore. And they started to have access to nicer things. However, they were also coming into a city that was perceived then um, as it is now to be only black and white. And uh, Lumbee people also don't, like many Native people don't, uh, reflect popular stereotypes of indigenous folks. So Baltimore still doesn't quite know what to make of us and tries to forget we exist and ask silly questions like, what are you? So this is the area where Lumbee people settled in mass in East Baltimore. And um, eventually there were so many of us, they started to call it our reservation affectionately. The first thing Lumbee people did when they got to Baltimore was establish a church. A lot of people don't realize that Lumbees are pervasively Southern Baptist. 
The church wasn't always in this building. It started in people's houses, but this is where it's been my entire life. From the church grew the American Indian Study Center, today known as the Baltimore American Indian Center, just a block north on South Broadway. And this is where I spent a lot of time growing up with um, American Indian youth in the city. I coordinated the Indian education program for Baltimore City Schools for a number of years and also had an art program, um, after school art program. And in our lifetime, mine and these children you saw in the picture, uh, we had the church, the Indian Center, the daycare across the street, and we also knew stories about um, some places that weren't around anymore, like the Volcano Bar, for example, which was at the corner of Fan and Fairmont and Ann. Um, however, if you go to this intersection today, it's so transformed, you can't even tell what corner the bar would have been on. So we just, we knew about that in story. And part of what I did with these kids um, was to walk around the neighborhood and just sort of inhabit the spaces and remind ourselves that we have as much right to be there as anybody else does. Um, in my mom's day, their intermarriage was not common. If you wanted to marry someone in tribal territory who was not Lumbee, you basically had to move away. So when Indian people moved away to Baltimore, they married everyone and had kids with everyone. And we have Greek Lumbees and Polish Lumbees and Mexican Lumbees and every kind of Lumbee. So these most recent generations are truly multi-racial and multi-ethnic people. The United States has a problem with folks who would be considered racially ambiguous. And it's kind of important to walk around and, and remind ourselves that we have history here, we belong. And we know that we're always walking in the footsteps of those who came before. So if you see this little filigree, you'll see the kids were standing about where these ladies were in the early 1940s. So I started to give walking tour tours of the Lumbee Indian community that consisted of the couple sites that I knew, the church, the Indian center, the daycare, and that's it. Um, and on one particular day, an elder of mine, Sister Linda Cox, uh, who is a church lady and who loves the Indian center, but is e even bigger fan of Jesus, um, she took over giving the tour, obviously. She has a longer memory than me, a longer life. And uh, we spent so much time in front of the church. She even sang, she invited everyone to Sunday school that I worried we weren't gonna make the other two stops on the tour. So I said, come on, Sister Linda, let's go. Let's try to get up to the Indian Center. And we didn't get more than 10 feet away before she stopped us and said, wait, don't you wanna tell them about the store in front of El Salvador restaurant? where I looked around and said, I don't see any store, Sister Linda, and I, I can't tell them about it. And she reminded me that where this restaurant is today was formerly Hokahe Indian Trading Post. And of course, I wouldn't be able to remember this because it closed before I was born. So this set me on a spree of digging through archives and um, convening my Lumbee elders to figure out what was in a, our community um, that is no longer there. Because if you figure anywhere from two to 7,000 Lumbees living in this little area of the city, of course we had more than a community center, a church, and a daycare. Around that time, I also found this 1969 map um, entitled the Lumbee Community in Baltimore, which was federally commissioned and you would think reputable um, and you can see where a big swath of the community is already labeled urban renewal area vacant. But I got real excited because there are sites on here that I didn't know from my own lifetime. So I took this to the elders and I was like, look, I found your community. Here's the reservation. And they looked and they were like, this is all wrong. Um, we don't see the things we recognize. And I said, oh, could you mark up the map? Could you add the things that are missing or correct what's wrong. And instead they decided they would turn it over and make their own maps collectively from memory. So here's an example. This is a map that was drawn by Miss Jeanette Hunt. And I like to show it because it conveys so much information. But also if you figure every square is a city block, you wonder where this stuff was because we're talking about a huge difference in scale. So they said what you should have done is you should have made a big street map that we could have all marked up. And that's what I did the next time we met. 
but I still wasn't able to relate what they were telling me to the neighborhood I knew in my mind and from living there my whole life. So I said, I'm just not going to understand until we go down there together and you point and say, this is where things were. So here's Sister Linda pointing for me at a place where our community has actually inscribed itself in the neighborhood. This is a brick down on Broadway Pier. But here's Aunt Jeanette also pointing to me at where she first lived when she came to Baltimore. And I was like, Aunt Jeanette, you lived in a park? And she said, no, this used to all be apartment houses. And from this aerial photo, you can see um, this was the very heart of the reservation that's now the Betty Hyatt Community Park and basically every space that Lumbees had other than the Indian Center and the church is now a vacant space or a green space. So I started digging through the archives to back up the stories they were telling me and I found us in the vertical files at the Pratt and the slides at the city archives. Sanborn maps have been incredibly helpful. I found our community leaders in old morgues of periodicals. Here's Sister Linda's mom, Miss Elizabeth Locklear. I find my husband's grandma in the archives who's no longer with us. Um, their families didn't know they're in there. The front of the Indian Center, uh, the Indian Education Project when it first started, a photo revealing that Lumbees were also involved with efforts to save the neighborhood, which it turns out all of it was um, slated to be raised. And Betty Hyatt, whose name is now on the park you saw, uh, is in this picture with Rosie Hunt, a co-founder of the American Indian Study Center. So Lumbees were involved in saving the neighborhood. It just happened that they were displaced um, more than any other population. I learned that our church was originally a Mariner's church and then a Methodist church. Finally found the volcano in the Afro-American. Here it shows an African-American who was um, injured at the volcano during the original racial uprising following the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The bouncer for the volcano, a Lumbee man named Clyde Oxendine who was a boxer. Our intertribal eating carry out in the unit block of South Broadway is now Tacos Jalisco. Um, there's this amazing photo album of street views of the whole neighborhood at the Baltimore City Department of Planning, ironically, that were taken as a result of urban renewal. They thought they'd just go take pictures of everything before they knocked it down. So here's East Baltimore Church of God, um, the second oldest Indian church. The Moonlight Restaurant, which was Greek-owned and a place where most Lumbee people could go in and eat for the first time, coming from the Jim Crow South. Uh, it's, it's now a house. Our daycare center used to be a bank. It's now uh, no longer owned by the Indian Center and it is um, leased to Powell Recovery Center. Sid's Ranch House Tavern, an Indian bar, uh, I finally found because it was an originally a movie theater. Now it's green space. Hartman's Barbecue, we had a Lumbee Barbecue restaurant, an after-hours Lumbee Barbecue spot in the city, this house on the left, and it's now part of a vacant church, which was sneakily added to an updated urban renewal plan for the area, just like last year. And I've been developing a walking tour, which in many ways is like a ghost tour. Um, right now we have a Google map, but it's going to be a real website and a print map. And we're developing a new archive so that all of these materials I found in disparate locations can live in one place. And one quick story to close. Uh, this is the McKim Center that's way up East Baltimore Street. And in the 1950s, they had youth social dances. And they, Ebony Magazine sent a photographer with the express mission to photograph Lumbee Indian youth who were going to these dances because we were just an anomaly on the scene. And then later they came out with this wild article, Mystery People of Baltimore, neither red nor white nor black, strange Indian tribe lives in a world of its own. And right away I recognized the woman at the center on the right is my Aunt Jeanette. And I was able to get a copy of this magazine from London of all places and bring it home to Aunt Jeanette, who was totally thrilled to see the neighborhood of her youth and her friends but she went back to the McKim Center with me 60 years later 
And as soon as she got in there, she remembered where she was standing, who she was with, what music she was listening to. So um, this is important to show that history is embedded in places, but also embodied by us. Uh, there are several articles that recently came out about the work that we're doing. They're very Googleable. Check them out in the Washington Post, the Smithsonian Magazine, Smithsonian Folklife Magazine, and a couple that I've authored and co-authored on the conversation. And I encourage anybody with questions to reach out, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I would now like to welcome Allison Rose Jefferson. Hello, everyone. Um, okay, well, thank you guys uh, today for the wonderful panels that we've had. Um, it's been very informative. Um, I, as an African-American uh, woman historian and heritage conservation consultant, my interests are to use history in broader education programs inclusive of, um, inclusive of conservation of places that are living links with the past, present, and, fu and future generations um, that are physical and spiritual reminders of significant times, people, and places in American history and culture. Intentionally, my work is uh, a social action or uh, practice to expand knowledge for the construction of a more inclusive public culture, historical memory, and national identity encompassing the diverse experiences of the American people and to help dismantle institutionalized racism. My work documenting and showcasing erased, overlooked, and absent stories at intangible and tangible heritage sites is grounded in my Black ancestors' century old freedom rights and social justice struggle. The project I'm going to talk about today. Belmar History Plus Art is an outgrowth of my continuing work to make the historical African American, make the historical Black Californian <clears throat> experience more visible through, uh, uh, through different methods for people's enjoyment as they gain and, uh, knowledge and inspiration that can empower them now and into uh, the future. The, the Belmar project um, had its origins at the uh, coastal, uh, at a coastal commission meeting in Los Angeles in March, two, March 2019. I took advantage of the opportunity uh, that was availed to me because I had been invited to make a presentation about uh, the African American history in Southern California um, to suggest to the commission that uh, they make Santa Monica officials uh, develop an informational, educational, and interpretive program to teach the public about the erased history of some of the early African American visitors and residents who lived. Uh, and contributed to making Santa Monica a vibrant and unique place uh, from the 1900s to the 1960s in beach neighborhoods south of the 10 freeway around uh, the Civic Center campus area uh, as a construction permit condition for, a, uh, for the new historic Belmar Park uh, that uh, uh, was going in at 4th uh, Street and uh, Pico Avenue. Where you see Belmar on the map, that's about where the park is. I was, as I said, I was invited to, um, uh, to this meeting and uh, at the time uh, uh, the, uh, the commission was getting ready to approve their landmark environmental justice policy for social equity and inclusion. And so with my suggestion 
uh, of this uh, 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 interpretive program, the commission was really happy with it because they saw that it was uh, uh, an action to set in motion the wider strategies they wanted to implement in their new uh, mandate to help ensure equitable uh, coastal access for uh, marginal communities. Well, the city of Santa Monica wasn't necessarily happy, happy about it, but they did decide that uh, since it was a permit condition that they're going to make the best of it. And what they did was they found some money and um, then they hired me and we went to work on this project. And um, in a year's time, we uh, have uh, come up with a multifaceted project and it's the first applied history or public history project and art project uh, that the city's undertaken and uh, we also uh, among the heritage that was revealed found uh, uh, in my research phase we found uh, two uh, uh, new sites with significance to uh, the historic, uh, historical black experience uh, which can potentially be uh, designated as landmarks along with all the uh, uh, history that we already knew that was in the area that's gone now. As uh, the project historian, I developed a context uh, essay uh, uh, and um, uh, 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 the essay builds on uh, the stories of my recent book, Living the California Dream, African-American Leisure Sites During the Jim Crow Era to underpin uh, the Belmar uh, History Plus Art Project. Other programming uh, uh, includes an outdoor exhibition for, of, of story panels and a large, uh, a large sculpture created by April Banks. Um, the installation of uh, the full outdoor exhibition will be completed by the end of February. And with uh, UCLA uh, colleagues and master uh, uh, public school teachers, uh, we developed um, K through 12 curriculum to meet the California state history, social science and ethnic studies framework and curriculum guidelines. And these lessons uh, along with my essay will be available uh, for review and use on the uh, Belmar History Plus Art website soon, along with other educational um, uh, resources and inspirational materials and uh, other project programming, such as um, uh, such as uh, a high school student uh, art project. Workshops are also planned uh, to introduce the curriculum to teachers for use with their students in the Santa Monica uh, Unified, Santa Monica, Mal Ma Santa Monica Malibu School District and other, uh, and other uh, uh, districts. The first African Americans, a little history, the first African Americans uh, uh, settled in Santa Monica in the late 19th century, uh, joining a multi-ethnic community of many uh, national and global, uh, 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 multi-ethnic community of many national and global backgrounds in building the new city. Most African Americans migrated from southern states, attracted by the climate, possibilities for new uh, life opportunities, and escape from Jim Crow white supremacy and anti-Black restrictions and racial injustice. They joined other migrants to the region in seeking their California and American dreams. The city of Santa Monica has the oldest African-American settlement uh, of any Pacific Rim city in the region. Over the last year, the, uh, the project was developed as the nation and the world grappled simultaneously with a pandemic uh, a bizarre dystopian United States presidential election drama and the Black Lives Matter movement's reinvigoration of the demand for racial equality and Black dignity and citizenship that has been forced prominently onto the national and global agenda. This project uh, 
is, uh, although started before all this happened, this project is a timely contribution to this dialogue as it helps open and inform contemporary life for understanding of those who came before us in Santa Monica's uh, historical African-American community life. It helps build a broader, richer, and more accurate understanding of our shared history and identity in our global, national, regional, and local citizenship. At the same time, this project is a reminder there is still so much that is not understood about the history of Santa Monica, California, and the U.S. There continues to be a need, there continues to be history and places and uh, history and places which need to be documented and made uh, known to people. Last year, uh, celebration and symbolism of uh, changes and solidarity uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States and globally have been articulated in dismantling, defacing, and scheduling a removal of monuments that symbolize uh, uh, icon uh, that symbolize icon uh, uh, icon uh, huh, uh, symbolize icons of uh, a racist past, and that are a reminder of how systems have failed us. A wide range of structures are described as monuments or commemorative and storytelling spaces inclusive of historic markers, statuary, earthworks, uh, uh, memorials, museums, uh, uh, and art installations. They exist at the intersection of public space and political power, public memory, and the enthusiasm of the uh, uh, groups which install them. Removal of uh, these uh, public space symbols to a racist past are a significant step to a more uh, just future and an important uh, and are important to over uh, uh, and, and, and are an important overdue structural reform. Symbolism does matter. The National Park Service um, the National Park Service guides the public policy of national historic preservation, uh, 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 of, of the National Historic Preservation Program to encourage Americans uh, uh, with, uh, uh, excuse to engage, to engage Americans with places and stories which make up the national identity. But with only, uh, as we've learned today, a very small percentage of uh, National Register uh, sites uh, or uh, uh, National Historic Monuments representing people of color and women uh, or members of other marginalized groups, a systematic reevaluation must occur for reform of preservation policy and governance structures, which privilege, architectural value, and material integrity over social value. This recognition of, of more diverse sites and creation of new public displays that recognize the underrepresented and challenge hegemonic and white supremacist narratives will help uh, connect a more representative history and identity. These new initiatives can be a vehicle for healing and education as well as cultural tourism in communities. These highlighted old, new, and needed future public actions are also reminders that there are still changes that must occur to dismantle white supremacy, police brutality, and anti-Black racism for a better society. Simultaneously to, uh, 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 to the National Heritage Conservation Policy Reform, 
new forms of monuments and spaces rooted in the ideals of commemorative justice should be asked for by those today demanding more inclusive narratives in public displays. These broader and innovative ways of sharing untold stories and places about Black life alongside designating landmarks, erecting traditional monuments, and other remembrance spaces will have a more lasting structural uh, effect. This is what I hope we have done in the development of the Belmar History Plus Arts multifaceted education, inspirational, and remembrance programming that tells a more complex American story that will enliven the past in resonant ways for more diverse audiences. The reconstruction of public meanings of Santa Monica's urban landscape and heritage conservation amplifies a broader societal understanding of Black life as part of a collective and diverse California cultural heritage to provide broader coastal zone accessibility for present and future generations. This commemorative justice initiative is an important, symbo uh, important symbolic action of equity and inclusion for social and environmental justice that recognizes African Americans and other marginalized communities have contributed to have contributed to making the colorful history of Santa Monica and that they have a right to historical and cultural sites and a place in the American identity, along with access to clean air, clean water, and enjoyment of America's natural and other resources. I challenge all that are here today to use your voice and enthusiasm for informed civic action to work to engage, educate, inspire, and empower yourselves and your communities for equity, justice, and recognition of underrepresented uh, 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 folks in the redefining of a more inclusive national identity by using all the tools of conservation and curation that are available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, we have a, about five minutes for questions. If anyone has questions, uh, let's see, there's one in the Google Doc here. Uh, Natalie and Sojin, would be interesting to compare what's happening in DC to what's happening in New Orleans. Is that something that you can answer? And that's actually my my question. I'm sorry to <laughs> jump in, but um, I, I've lived in both places. And um, yeah, I just uh, in New Orleans after Katrina, they've um, really sort of um, policed um, like second lines and music. And, you know, they you know, you need permits now because of the neighborhoods are changing. And so just wondering if you if you've compared that at all to what's happening in D.C. with GoGo. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, my husband's actually from New Orleans, so I go to New Orleans quite a bit, and um, I have uh, uh, friends who are also scholars of GoGo in New Orleans. So we actually did a Don't Mute DC Meets Don't Mute NOLA uh, series of conversations and concerts where we brought in um, second line bands. Uh, it's, I'm sorry, brass bands, and we put them in a lineup with GoGo -Go bands um, as a way to have that conversation that you're talking about, like about the connections between these two chocolate cities um, that are currently under threat and, um, you know, being criminalized and displaced. So, so yes, we've explored it and I will keep co uh, continue to explore it because I love it. I love both. I mean, the both of the cities are so vibrant and, um, you know, very much under similar threats. So I have a, um, we, I saw a lot of questions for Ashley. 
about Lumbee culture in Baltimore. And Ashley, I'm curious if you would be able to speak to what's what's next for you and in documenting this history and in, you know in addition to the walking tour and do you have support from the city of Baltimore? How are you getting funding? Uh, funding is pretty interesting. Um, my work is at the intersection of art and I guess humanities or I don't even know what you call it. Is there a word for what I do? So it's difficult to pitch this to preservation people because it's not really a capital project. It's um, not exactly art. It's truly interdisciplinary. Uh, certainly a lot of our city's cultural organizations have asked me to speak about this work because people don't realize we're here still. Um, I do still give the walking tour um, more if we weren't in pandemic times, but I do have concerns about that because the neighborhood continues to change and I don't want to contribute to um, speeding that process along. I just looked at all my students one day when we were walking along Lombard Street and the looks we were getting and, and realized maybe it wasn't such a great idea to bring big groups of people who aren't from there to there. Um, but I, I still, like, you know, if you reach out to me personally, I'm happy to walk people around. And what I'm most excited about right now is the establishment of this new archive, the Ashley Minner Papers, at the Maryland Folklife Archives and the Albino Kuhn Library at UMBC, which is publicly accessible and the collection will be duly stored with um, the Baltimore American Indian Center. So the next people who want to learn about Lumbees in Baltimore won't have to do all the running around that I've done. And um, yeah, working with the elders, you know, especially during this time is um, fraught and uh, just encourage everybody to do what they can to protect our our institutional memory that lives in these people, right? Like wear, wear your masks and stay home, please. And when it's safer, I'll walk you around the neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. Um, just one final question. I don't, I don't see any popping up here. So I will direct this one to Natalie and Sojin. Just out of curiosity, the, the um, introduction of that, the Shea building, the modern development across the street from the GoGo -Go store, um, it seems like it's such an affront to the existing community. Was there pushback by community members and were they able to leverage anything from the developers to have a right to build there across the street from that important space? Um, there was pushback from the community. So that was actually one of the things that came up in the oral histories that we did. Um, at the time, the Shea was built, was erected over an empty lot in uh, 2015. Um, and at the time, there were kids in a youth program at the Shaw Community Center that actually did a go go um, theatrical performance um, that talked about the Shea and that woman in the poster, and they thought she was a witch. Um, telling them that it was time to go. And so they did, and it really sort of foreshadowed what happened, you know, a couple of years later with Don't Mute DC. So um, they were speaking out, like that That poster was really scary for everybody. I live not too far away from there and it, it's kind of scared me. Like she has arrived, seemed very ominous um, when it, you know, when it went up there. Um, but as far as them being able to leverage that into anything else? The answer is really no. And I mean, to this day, they've never spoken to us. Like the management of the building has never spoken to us. Um, they were sort of just waiting for the neighborhood to continue to change. Um, and I did speak to, I haven't told Sojin this, but I, I spoke to um, the owner of the, the GoGo -Go record store and he's still having trouble. Um, not with the neighbors, but just with change and being able to sort of maintain that space, like a lot of economic pressures, corporate pressures. Um, and so it's still very much under threat. And so I think like many projects, it's difficult. You know, we were, the, the, we had a lot of good momentum before COVID um, shut everything down. And um, so, yeah, again for, again, for similar to what Ashley was saying, and hi, Ashley, by the way, I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, if anybody has any suggestions, um, you know, please uh, do get in touch with us. Can I just ask a question, Natalie? You may have said it in your presentation and I missed it, but do, do they own the property, the GoGo -Go folks? 
They do not. Um, it's actually owned by an it's an African American uh, family that owns it. Uh, they've owned it since the riots. Um, they they have a few more right. years on, on the sixty eight riots. Sorry, in D.C. So they have um, they have a few more years on the lease. So they're they're not so concerned about being pushed out. But um, you know, I, I had a long conversation with uh, Don the other day, and what's really difficult, and this is why it's so much around gentrification, is that he. Metro PCS is like pay as you go prepaid plan. So he has a really explicitly working class clientele that comes into the store and it's foot traffic. And the corporate models are really moving away from that. And so he's really like, he's facing changes on multiple fronts to just sort of maintain that space and also maintain a space that serves retail for working class people you know, amid many of the very much more high-end restaurants and the sort of, you know, um, establishments that are serving places like the Shea. So um, I, it's so on the nose, everything about what he's experienced is on the nose and continues to be on the nose around gentrification. Thank you, Natalie and Sojin, uh, Allison and Ashley um, for your presentations. I am a fan of all of your works. Um, my one of my doctors is near um, the corner <laughs> of uh, on uh, for Don't Meet DC. So the first time I walked, I got off the metro and I was like, "Oh, I'm here! I have arrived." <laughs> the music is back on. So um, and it just I think every one of you, uh, the presentations just inspires us to go when we can, as Ashley mentioned, to visit these places, even for whatever remains. Um, and really think about um, so many levels of trauma and loss um, as we try to preserve what remains. And so I thank you and I thank Shane for your awesome moderating um, of this session. And I know we're going to jump in. We have two minutes for the, before we go to the next session. And I want to thank everyone who's just been on all day. It's, you know, I know it's, it's a long day, so I appreciate folks who have been able to go um, and, and stay with us. But again, thank you to Allison, Natalie, Sojin, Ashley, um, Antonia, and Shane for this wonderful session. And we are gonna be back in a minute <laughs> for the next session. We'll give you a little break. Thank you.